Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Regenerative Grazing Office Hour series, a six-part series hosted by the Embra Grazing Partnership. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be posted online. Uh, since 2020, the uh, Champaign County Soil, Water, and Conservation District, the Land Connection of U University of Illinois Extension, uh, Terra Elosa LLC, Illinois Soybean Association, and the Pasture Project have partnered to provide education and resources to increase regenerative grazing practices in and near the Embra River watershed. Uh, we've held field days, online training sessions, and online informal discussions with grazers, farmers, land owners, educators, and stakeholders about the benefits of regenerative grazing, and we look forward to hosting more events and sharing resources. Uh, you can find the page about the EGP and our events and resources on uh, the website, which I will share in the chat. Uh, we are so happy to have you all here today. Uh, I am Nicole Haverback uh, of the University of Illinois Extension, and I will be facilitating today's session. I'd like to thank the members of the Embra Grazing Partnership for organizing this series, uh, Mallory Krieger of Terra Alosa, Jennifer Jones of Illinois Soybean Association, um, Aaron Gundy, Morgan Cobble, and Ivan Dozier of Champaign County Soil and Water Conservation, uh, Jason, Jesse Schaefer of the Land Connection, Katie Bell of University of Illinois Extension and Kelsey Virgin of the Pasture Project. Uh, this series is funded in part by North Central Sayers Professional Development Program. Today is part three, uh, focusing on cattle breed considerations and selection for regenerative grazing. We are joined today by Travis Matier, Beef Commercial Ag Educator with the University of Illinois Extension, and Evan Chwedi, farmer from Breeze, Illinois. Uh, Travis and Evan will share their knowledge and experience associated with grazing and discuss our topic, uh, cattle breed considerations for grazing in a joint presentation, followed, followed by a moderated question and answer session. Uh, as we progress through today's talk, uh, feel free to drop your questions into the chat and we'll get them answered, um, or you can raise your hand and ask the, ask the questions verbally as well. With that being said, uh, I will let Travis introduce himself and get things started. Thanks, Nicole. I'll uh, attempt to share my slides here. We'll see if this works. Nicole, you can confirm, does that look appropriate? Yeah, looks good. Okay, so um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about cattle genetics for grazing. And as Nicole said, I'm Travis Matier with the U of I as a beef extension educator. One of the, I think the one of the beauties of beef cattle production is the diversity of production methods that are out there. And that's cer certainly something I like to embrace in my position with the University of Illinois is discussions around various production models and markets. And so it's, it's a true pleasure to be here and talking about this and sharing conversation with Evan today. So Let's see, got to get the slide to advance. So just briefly about myself, uh, my parents met when they were uh, exhibiting Hereford cattle. Uh, so Hereford cattle have a kind of a sweet spot in our family and, and we continue to have purebred registered Hereford cows. Um, I predominantly own commercial cow herd myself. Um, one of my passions really is livestock evaluation. So I love looking at all types of livestock and picking cattle and phenotypically and on paper and genetically that I think um, would suit our market and in a certain market. Um, we also do a, uh, our very best to try to extend the grazing season in our own cattle herd and limit um, costs and, and do some cost control. And so this picture on the far right, we're, we're grazing some, some millet, a summer annual. So we do do, um, uh, a lot of, of different things that we preach, I guess, or try to practice what we preach on our home farm. Um, I'm not actively grass finishing any cattle, but certainly have consulted with a lot of producers, on grass-based genetics and grass production. And so we're gonna talk more about that today in this discussion. As I mentioned, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, be involved in the cattle business. And so today we're gonna focus more on 
that grass-based production, that bullet point there on the bottom right. And in my opinion, um, an emphasis in grass-based production is cattle that fit their environment and come with a low maintenance kind of mentality. And I think that um, as a beef industry as a whole, we, we maybe need to get back to some of that thought process of picking genetics that fit our environment. And there are going to be different environments out there, but the, the grass-based system is one that I think is growing in popularity for, for sure, and one that that market is continuing to develop. And so definitely a worthy discussion today. I always in my conversations about genetics, start with a slide like this and people kind of are like, well, did he forget the topic he was talking about? And But if you are going to make genetic selection, you absolutely have to know your market. And so if your market is, is that, 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 I guess that's the beauty of the cattle business is there are so many different markets, but in this system, we definitely need to know what our customers want and uh, how we can produce a product based on that market. And then you do have to market it. So target that market, um, make sure that it's a market that you can develop on your farm. And then the next slide here talks about building that market. And so we'll hear, we'll hear more from Evan about maybe how he identified that market and how he's building a market for his cattle. And I think that that's, something that will be crucial in making genetic selection as, as you look at your cattle herd. So on this slide, I kind of thought, okay, well, what would most people think genetics for grazing look like? And what will most people think genetics for grazing don't look like? And so I just put up these two pictures here real quickly. And the cow on the left, she's full, she's plump, she's shiny, she looks moderate in stature. She's got her head down grazing. I think most people would say, yep, that cow is fit for environment. Uh, that looks like a cow that's genetically uh, fit for grazing. And then the cow on the right, you see a little more daylight underneath that cow. We can see her ribs. She's maybe not full. And we can talk about that here in just a second, but she's carrying a little extra hair and just doesn't look as thrifty. And so, so I think some people would say, that cow is definitely not genetics for grazing. And I guess as an extension specialist, when I visit farms, yes, we need to look at the cattle, but we need to focus on the environment as well. And so if you look below those cattle uh, at their feet and what they're consuming, the management is, is a big part of that as well. So you can see that cow on the right, we maybe got uh, some different weed. There's not a lot of grass there for that cow to eat, right? And so maybe that cow's environment, um, maybe we're not managing that environment correctly. Uh, even if we do, maybe that cow doesn't fit her environment. But what I'm getting at here is our genetics for grazing need to fit our management. And you're going you're gonna to see that several times here on these slides. So in my opinion, you have to have the genetics that match your environment and your management. In most situations, the law of averages will tell you that smaller framed, more moderate milking cows that maintain good body condition score are year in, year out going to be more successful in a grazing environment. And I'm going to put Evan on the spot real quick, but Evan, would you tend to agree with that statement? Just basics, the law of averages, if you're going to go out and select a group of cows, smaller, more more moderate milking cows that are in good body condition, you would say those are genetics that you would want to propagate in your herd? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, most of our herd is uh, that small to moderate, um, you know, three to six frame cattle, uh, weighing 900 to 1200 pounds is really our range. Um, and exactly right. We, I don't want a cow that's going to need a lot or have high milk production. That's going to cost me a lot of groceries or extra grass that I got to come up with so that's exactly right yeah and so i think that's that's a good starting place right and we can get off into the details but a quick if you're not familiar with maybe genetics um that would suit your operation that's the quick uh, cliff notes version hey we need a, a cow that can survive on forage that is lower maintenance that does have 
uh, the ability to keep in good body condition score throughout the year on a forage based or forage only diet in some situations. And so I think a lot of times we as we as cattle uh, entrepreneurs or cattle breeders, we may get off into the weeds and think, but I think that's a great starting place. I also think that we need to take the time to let the cows teach us. And so instead of us being the teacher, we need to pay attention and observe. That's one of my biggest things in cattle production is observation. And so if you observe a cow that has a calf every year, she weans an acceptable weight. Those cattle can gain weight on grass and finish appropriately on the rations that you have on your farm. Those are the genetics you want to, pro to propagate. So those are, those are cattle that are signaling to you that their genetics match your environment and your management. I think sometimes the trouble, once we get cattle on our own farm, it's maybe not too hard to figure that out. We, you know, we are observative. We can um, see that. But when we go to purchase in genetics from another um, supplier, do we, are we doing our homework and looking at how that supplier produces cattle? How do they manage cattle? What is that environment like? I often think that's maybe where more mistake gets made in genetics is that we don't maybe investigate the proper um, or do due diligence to looking into the environment and manage those genetics that we, we select. So I think one of the questions that I had for Evan goes right along with this is, have you purchased in cattle um, from another breeder, how successful were those cattle? Um, were they from a similar environment as yours? Um, and then maybe your preference at this point, uh, would you rather purchase cattle in or raise your own replacements? Kind of what is your thoughts going forward for your herd there? Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of, a couple different things. I, I just started, um, 2018, my own, uh, beef operation. Uh, I've always grown up on my dad's, but so me with getting in it and buying my first farms, I was, I didn't want to wait for heifers. So I went out and bought and I'm coming to realize that was probably not the right thing to do. Just take my time and, and find the genetics that work for me. But, um, I worked with, I bought a herd out of West Virginia was one. They were rotationally grazed on pasture. Um, never had a shed no nothing and that's kind of where I was starting at so I thought it was a and it was a good buy so I went that way uh probably half of them worked out real well um other probably quarter of them were uh our average at best and then the the rest the other quarter probably sold so it's a uh, that was a kind of a little bit of learning curve using uh genetics out of our own herd has been the best suited for us um but we do buy bulls that are from Missouri, uh, fescue based, uh, feral genetics, um, which are small, moderate frame cattle, uh, made for grazing every day and not, uh, not being supplemented. Um, so bulls is still the main thing we're still buying, uh, now getting the part, uh, point of our herd size that we're going to go to this may will be, uh, instead of weaning everything or at weaning we'll keep back a couple of our own bulls that are looking pretty impressive and uh see if that starts turning the tide on uh, the genetics that works for exactly our area because i have i farm about 45 minutes away i have uh, two farms um and just in those two places i can have one herd you know looks like they're on the same kind of grass but the gain is completely different and i, I so i think there is a lot to say about that you go buy Gen-X from another state or another part of the state, your own state. Um, there's a lot of a lot more challenges that come with that, and nothing's as cracked up as it was said to be. Uh, we we did get a herd out of Northeast Missouri, uh, 45 head this summer. Uh, came off beautiful grass. Um, the farm that I took over, it has uh, it's been abused over the years. So I'm in the process with with the fence and getting soil uh, back up to par. It was, it was taken advantage of on the P and K levels. So I think that had a lot to do with where those cows really sloughed off. It wasn't their own fault. It was just the nutritional value of my grass on that farm. Not that I was managing it wrong. I was, I was still ro rotational grazing 
leaving leaving plenty of grass left and moving them fast. And uh, there's still a change there. So sorry, it's a little bit along to your your question there, but uh, I there is a there's definitely a there's definitely things that you can see from one herd to the next. And I, I would go with stick with your own genetics if at all possible. No, I think that's an excellent point and really good advice. Um, I guess I'm going to move on just in the interest of time and click through a few of these slides, but I, I, I find your, your, your answer and your information, I think extremely applicable to most folks that I've dealt with as well. Um, you know, our, we were posed to answer the question, what breeds are best for grazing? And I'll be honest with you, I think that most breeds can work. There's more variation within a breed than there is from breed to breed. And I think that when you're selecting genetics for grazing, it's probably best suited to, like Evan said, you know, adapt cattle to your own environment and then select genetics that are matching your environment. But if you're just getting started, and I'm sure Evan mentioned this, we he he sought out cattle that were in a grazing environment, that were low maintenance cattle already, that were treated similarly to what they were going to be treated like in his herd and the kind of cattle that worked there. And I think that me and having a passion for livestock evaluation, there's there is something to looking for a kind of cattle that fit a grazing environment. And so when I say kind, I mean more or less what cattle phenotypically look like. So again, cattle that are a good body condition score that shed their hair coat quickly in the spring, um, even a shiny hair coat, that would indicate that they're in a good mineral status um, and performing well for that environment. I think a lot of times people mentioned big middled cows, small stature cows, wide muzzled cows, um, cows that uh, have small uh, tidy udders and, and are wedge shaped. And you can get into a few more just phenotypic descriptors, but I think all of these things do help maybe get, off, get that ball off rolling in the right direction. And so, um, Smaller cows that eat more grass are going to have a better opportunity to maintain body condition score and be reproductively successful at every year. Um, also think if we're looking for cows that can stay fertile long term on a grass based scenario that they need to they need to do they definitely need to have um, kind of a wedge shape to them. They do need to be very feminine. And I think they need to look that full, robust fill. Um, and that kind of goes back to that first picture, that first slide that I I um, talked about. Evan, is there something that you would add? When you're looking for cattle, when you're selecting those herds that you selected, and then now picking out cattle that you're going to keep and retain to your herd, what are some things that you would add to this list or you would emphasize, say like, man, this is the biggest thing for me? There's a lot of many very good points that I would I would like to, but just the main main one still is milk production. I'm huge on that. I don't I don't uh, when I'm grazing I don't want to have to deal with something that's going to produce a lot of milk and get sucked down for me and not have the chance to rebreed. So that's one's a big thing for me. You know, EPDs hey, 15 to 20. Um, but then uh, frame size, like we said, but a lot of these same things that are on here, um, the shiny hair coat, I, that's uh, on the culling side, that's where I will start to make that at. But our still our biggest thing um, is conception rate. So if they're not working on my farm, I don't have a zero, zero uh, policy of keeping that over. I did have a very interesting case here the last two years. I had a sickness in one herd. So that was part of it. But then the next was, uh, I was, if you heard about the Illinois cattle rustling, that was in Southern Illinois, that was me. I had uh, close to 74 head, I believe got stolen this summer. So there was a lot of stress went into that. So that was my exemption to that. I, I did keep some back out open there, but otherwise for the most part, conception is my, uh, my biggest thing. 
Makes sense. I mean, you're letting the cows tell you, right? Are, are you going to, are you working uh, for me or am I working for you? And I think that that totally makes sense. Um, this was the first picture on my first slide, but I think uh, what I wanted to illustrate here is that, you know, if you walk up into a herd of cattle, it should be somewhat immediate to you whether these cattle look like they're, they're thriving or they're not and kind of that thriving or just surviving. And so immediately, I think these cattle, um, good body condition score cattle, that this is towards the end of a day. We were actually at a pasture walk here towards the end of the day, cattle out grazing. You can see that in this pasture, it's predominantly fescue. I know there's a little foxtail in there, but for the most part, these cows are grazing fescue. Um, they're full. You look, we're picturing here their left side, good intake. Um, these cows are, I think, in my opinion, thriving. So not a lot of flies, not a lot of, uh, um, uh, it's harder to see because we're in the shade here at, towards the end of the day, but smooth, shiny hair coats all shedded off on fescue pasture. I mean, these cattle fit that environment, in my opinion. And I think you can um, I want, just wanted to kind of throw a few pictures in here to help continue to illustrate because one of the big points that I'm trying to bring across here in, in this presentation is that you can phenotypically help get off on the right start. And I think that, um, you know, looking at cattle, there are a few things that you can identify. So the the black bull on the top left, uh, obviously he's maintaining his condition very well a bull that's very masculine. Um, and again, kind of when we talk about wedge shape, we want the bulls to be wider up front and narrow and taper towards their rear and the females, the opposite. So we want the females to wedge more towards a deeper uh, flank and maybe run more downhill. And I think both these bulls wedge the right way. Um, I think immediately when I saw this picture here on the top right of this uh, red bull, I thought, you know, here's a bull is maybe a little thinner in condition, but you, we look behind him and he's probably in a situation where we've got some drought or some poor forage availability. And so he's still doing very well condition wise for the forage that's in front of him. Um, so I think we always, again, have to consider that when we're making genetic selection is are they fit for their environment? Are they thriving or surviving. And I think in a pretty challenging environment, that bull is still thriving. Bottom left hand, obviously a large frame cow that's skinny, um, probably not the right fit a genetics. Bottom right hand side, we've got a cow here that has some condition. Her hair coat's kind of shiny. I just see her physical appearance more like a steer. And she's built just a bit um, boxy. And I, I don't see that beautiful phenotypic wedge or femininity from this this female so I would stay away from that one just a little bit too and then bottom center a female that I think exemplifies more of what you're looking at from a female that can that has the the condition the body the the fleshing ease and the wedge type shape that would allude to a bit more longevity on a lower maintenance diet so th those are just maybe some some phenotypic indicators and again some visual references um, again not straying away from the topic here but i do believe that we have to keep a holistic approach uh, to genetics so if you you can buy the best genetics in the world but if you don't take care of them you don't handle them the right way and you don't make those better improvements in your herd and your environment you will see that you know you'll have issues with um, the production, the performance, and the profitability of those herds. So keep in mind health, handling, and selecting for those functional traits. Um, there are a few resources I wanted to mention here that I think um, maybe these folks would be more experts and that you could really do a deep dive into grass-based genetics. And I know the Pasture Project uh, has uh, this publication written by Alan Williams on their website that you can download in a PDF format that does a great job of describing selecting for grass-based genetics. Um, there's a book that I've read. It's uh, Wortham Lectures. Uh, it's actually based off of um, kind of some lectures by uh, Jan Bonsma, Dr. Jan Bonsma, 
Um, if any of you are familiar with the book, uh, Man Must Measure, that's a pretty popular one, but hard to accrue these days. So this would be an alternative that I think is um, really cost, it doesn't cost very much and can lend uh, an easy read to some um, really, I think, good basic strategy on selecting cattle that are fit for their environment. And then there's other pu uh, publications and presentations out there about choosing cattle for the right climate and environment. Uh, Steve Campbell does a good presentation on that. You can find that online as well. But I, I'll wrap up. Um, and this is directly taken from uh, the Wortham Lectures. Uh, it talks about the symbiosis of animal and, and the human and the, how it all works. So there's a lot of external factors here in this wagon wheel with the environment and how that can affect the animal. And it really is up to us as, as the, the man or the human uh, to make sure that we're selecting the appropriate genetics to deal with that environment. So your genetics must match your environment. And I think it's a big part of animal husbandry and stockmanship is to make the right choices genetically on your farm. So I'm going to close there. I know we want to hear more for, from Evan, so I'll kick it over to you, Evan. Thanks, sir. Uh, yes, my name is Evan Schutte. Uh, I'm from Southern Illinois, located, located in uh, Breeze, Illinois. I farm in Marion County predominantly, a little bit in Clinton, and the remainder in Madison counties um rotationally grazed for the most part as of right now we're still still out grazing limping along with some bale grazing uh to stretch out my stockpile um we're running around 260 head of mama cows right now uh about half are red angus the other half are black angus scimitol crosses um we are um we're running right now. We have a group of 45 that are uh, one bull for 45 cows, and another uh, we have 56 on another group. Um, that is, uh, that's all with one bull as well. So that's one thing we strive for is uh, they're not going to cut it in two months. That so we're gonna we're gonna move them down the road um, for bulls with no added supplement. Um, I guess a little bit more back about myself would be that I have uh, come back to. My dad's seed business, full-time, uh, sell corn, beans, wheat, cover crops, pasture mixes, um, also on the Farm Credit Illinois board. And then but main, what I'm moving more toward is the full-time uh, cattle operation slash uh, I also have a row crop operation that is no-tilled and cover cropped. Uh, so I do have a wide range. Grew up uh, working on family farm that was... Uh, 180 head of uh, mama cows, black Angus. Um, and then now, uh, or went to work for my cousins that was dairy farm and hog operation. And now I was getting back into what I liked in 2018, bought my first farm and taking that with equip uh, and then just rolling one piece onto the next. So just uh, trying to build up an operation from nothing, but our, our county is ground been going anywhere from 16 to 20,000 an acre. And uh, the county over where I have most of mine is in Marion County, and it is bringing anywhere from four to six for pasture, and tillable is eight to ten. So that more fits me for starting out. So it's a little bit about myself. Um, I guess uh, for our operation, like I had mentioned earlier, conception is, uh, is my biggest driver for uh, making my herd better that's going to fit my operation. We have a lot of the pasture that I took over was abused. Um, we're talking pH levels of 4.8 to 5.2. Uh, and P and K are about uh, in existence. So I've been working with chicken litter and rotationally grazing and then also coming back whenever I can't get grazed fast enough to be clipped. But try not to put up any hay. And then now I'm purchasing some hay to try building some organic matter and keeping the cows on the pasture longer, give them a strip of grass, unroll some hay, just kind of give them a little bit of both. Um, I think we'll be with that. That way our fall calvers should make it here to uh, first part of April. And I have, uh, I use a lot of cover crops. So on my uh, 
row crop side, we're using uh, flying it on with a drone, uh, rye, ryegrass, turnips, radishes, some clover, uh, getting some use out of that. And then uh, the rest is I'll put out uh, normally a decent amount of mix of uh, just straight cover crop to be grazed. So, um, I guess, uh, is there anything else for me? Anything else I can tell you guys? Evan, I would just while we're still on kind of like your intro, maybe touch on a little bit of, you know, how you manage things in the winter. You you kind of touched on like your cover crops and and stuff like that. I'd love to hear kind of just your management approach for your colder months of the year. Yes, yeah, so it's it has definitely been a trick, especially with uh, just starting on my own here in 2018. Um, I did work with NRCS, um, so I have travel lanes and. Uh, two winter feeding stations, um, did that on my original farm. So first year I had to use the, uh, for first two years, I utilized my winter feeding stations to the fullest extent. It was a pretty rough winter for me starting out and uh, wasn't set up, didn't have much stockpile. So the barn was where it was at. Um, now last year I actually purchased another farm and with the amount of cattle we had, I was able to, I had enough stockpile to make it through winter. And this year our herd really grew. So I'm kind of in between of if I want to go to the barn or not. And I decided to buy a bale enroller and we're enrolling hay behind, uh, just goes behind side by side. So I just give them a little sliver of grass of stockpile a day. And then our stockpile right now is probably two, two and a half foot tall. So it, it's not too bad. Um, it was fertilized in the fall after the last grazing and then, and then clipped, knocked down any excess weeds there and make her look pretty. That's one thing for me. I gotta have it look pretty, but, um, but for stockpile, yes, we start normally like most August is when we get after holding back. Um, but most of my farms will be around two to three times. We try getting across them in, in a year. Um, besides that, not a whole lot of science behind how much is just kind of way it's worked out is I'll buy hay when I need to, but I have yet to put up hay on my own ground. Just trying to stay away from that and build these soils back up. Thank you for that. And Travis, I saw you have a, or Ted put a question in the chat. Um, he asked, how do you market your beef for your operation? Right. Uh, thanks, Ted. Was um, I started? Like I said, I started in eighteen, and I knew that my cattle for my operation needed to be the smaller frame, not going to have much milk, so my weaning weights weren't going to be crazy. Um, but I'm still looking at forty-five to fifty-five percent uh, weaning weight is my ideal range. But with that being said, my cows being three to six frame cows. When I go to the, when I go to the sale barn, I'm usually going to take a dock on on hit. They want those big, big, nice, flashy cattle that are going to be anywhere from maybe 13 to 1600 pounds. Where mine are going to come in more times than not, 1100, 1200 pounds. I mean, I'll have heifers down the 900 to 1000, and they'll look like butterballs. So, I I'm moving more that way. Just one is fits my operation with low input, but then also I can take that to locker beef. So what Ted was asking there, yes, uh, locker beef has been what I'm moving to. I just got my label um, approved and an uh, LLC started. So I'm, I have been doing a little bit of just quarters, halves and holes, but now I'm working with a couple of restaurants that are getting beef from me. But back to on the locker beef side, quarters, halves and holes, a lot of people do not want to spend that kind of money on a 15, 1600 pound animal for what I would like to charge per pound uh, hanging weight. This way, when they're 900 to 1100 pounds, say it's a lot more feasible and it, it's not as much meat because also that's another part. They don't, not just the cost, just the amount of meat if they're going to go through that in a time frame. So, with here being smaller animals, I think I have a, not a niche market, but I have kind of an in to push more beef. And the way I look at it is if I can have my smaller cows, I can have three cows to most people's two cows that uh, some more value added that I have. 
Um, now if we're at, I'm at max capacity for cattle. So I will start uh, selling more cull cows and, or culling more cows and just replacing cattle faster. Um, you know, the ones that are gonna be five and sixes are, you know, nice, but if I can, if I know my younger stock is gonna beat that, then I, I have no problem in the next year or two moving them down the road. Um, but I would like to get up to having all my beef uh, um, heifers and steers that I do fatten go as locker beef, but at that time, that's a that's a lot of quarters, halves, and holes. So that's why I started on the restaurant side. Maybe I can move some more that way. Um, they are also I have I do have the option to go um, to a lot of feed feed yards around here. I'm fortunate of that. The dairy that's getting out is wanting to have uh, access to all farm straight from farm to their feedlot. So I, I do have that as a backup for the ones that I don't. And this, this past year was my first year that I have done a handful of grass-fed beef. This is, uh, not turned out too bad. Just takes a lot longer for me to get that return. So it's a little harder for me to stomach here at the beginning, but I think that's another market that I can hit and uh, capture being this close to St. Louis. I'll just jump in here real quick. I think that, um, again, back to knowing your market, um, you heard Evan mention the discount maybe at the sale barn for some cattle, but the premium that he's going to reap from his own label direct to consumer. So I think if a producer is trying to determine genetics here, you have to realize there is going to be a transition period while you're building your market, while you're establishing your brand, your reputation that, so this is not an overnight deal. You say, Oh, I bought this uh, group of heifers or a starter herd. And now I'm going to make a bunch of money doing it this way. Um, you have to, you really do have to start, I think, with that market in mind. Um, one of the questions that uh, Evan posed to me in our kind of e email chat here was using EPDs and do they play a role in selection? And I, I think, you know, as someone who works for University of Illinois Extension has probably talked about EPDs um, quite, quite often and definitely that through the Illinois performance tested bull sale, it's something we emphasize. I think, again, if you're going to use EPDs, you may have heard Evan mentioned uh, milk numbers, you know, maybe wanted to have a moderate milk number, like I think might have referenced 15 or something like that as a moderate milk number that he's selecting for. So you're, you need to know your targets. You need to maybe know what, uh, what, what these numbers mean. And so I think it's just, just as important to use EPDs to select for minimums or uh, production windows as, as, it, as it is for maximums. And I think in a lot of genetics where you may hear a presentation, someone talk about, well, stay away from these cattle, stay away from these, these, we may, that may, those cattle may have been selected more for maximums in terms of EPDs. And so it's important to match those EPDs with your production environment. So moderate milk, moderate mature weight, there's numbers out there for those. Some other ones that I would encourage you to look at is the dollar E and the energy breed or uh, the Angus breed. Dollar E is a direct correlation of what that cow's energy requirements would be. And so a higher dollar E may, may allude to the fact that cow's not gonna have as high energy requirements. That might be a useful selection tool. But don't stray away and maybe throw all the EPDs away because cavities is still important no matter what your, your uh, herd structure is, no matter what your market is. Um, and then I think docility is very important as well. I know a lot of these cattle get accustomed to being moved every day and they tame down quite quickly, but still cattle that have genetics for acceptable level of docility is important. And then, um, as I tell any anybody who's selecting genetics, those EPDs are are useful, but they're not very useful if those cattle aren't fit, they aren't functional, and they aren't cattle that are from a similar management scheme as yours. And so, those are kind of paramount, in my opinion, before you go hunting a bunch of numbers 
Um, I, I do appreciate the clarification. EPD is expected progeny difference, something that all breeds registered cattle would have available. Um, and I think it's something that's been a useful selection tool for a lot of animal breeders. And there's no reason that it couldn't be a useful tool if as long as you understand what those numbers mean and what those numbers would bring to your production environment and your market. And Travis, a uh, question for you would be uh, with the, uh, as a university or I guess from my own standpoint, is there a threshold or has there been a study done to see the difference between uh, different herd sizes in cattle? To ratios? Yeah, so what what's what's the ideal cow size? I think is what most people ask. Say, hey, here I'm grazing uh, my targets to graze many days out of the year. What's what size of cow should I pick? And can I get my yardstick out, measure that cow, and see, hey, this is the one that's going to work for me. And I think going back to the comment we made was, hey, this cow, smaller stature cows, moderate milking, lower milking cows that are going to fit a low maintenance environment. Yes, those in general speaking, those will all work. I think one of the most encouraging things as I diverge and go more towards the research side here is that we have evaluated um, voluntary forage intake, residual forage intake in beef cows. And what we've found is there's a large variation within the population. And so as an animal breeder, I think the encouraging thing is when you have a large variation, there's opportunity to select improvement. If you look at the pork and poultry industries, those animals are on the same diet every day and they have honed in feed efficiency to the point where they can be absolutely profitable, the most profitable in that production environment. In the beef industry, we've got cows grazing grass in a good year, lots of grass in a dry year or drought year, not much grass at all. Those cattle a lot of times are weaned and sent maybe to a backgrounding uh, situation again, where mother nature is, uh, we're very dependent on mother nature for feed resources. Um, if they finish in a feedlot, we've got a totally different ration in front of that animal than the mother cow. So we've got so much variation built into our system. We haven't began to really hone in on feed efficiency. I think I'm encouraged, though, that the variation in our population, we can select for more efficient cattle. And there's definitely research out there to say that through um, feed efficiency can be approved in cattle. So I think in the general sense, those small cows that eat a lot and don't milk a whole lot can maintain themselves, their calf at side, and breed back and maintain that in utero pregnancy, right? That makes sense. That's easy to say, easy to, easy to kind of um, apply and practice on farm. I do think there's data coming in the future um, where we can select cattle that are even more efficient in a production environment, even grass. Um, Sure, it's easier in a controlled environment, but I think there are some metabolical efficiencies that we will find in different cattle that will help them be more efficient. So I'm encouraged there, maybe futuristic thinking, um, but I also think that the, the, the bold principle or the base principle of just selecting cattle that can support themselves, their calf, and that pregnancy does, does really yield to a fairly efficient production system. Because like you said, they're open. They're not going to stay around, and that's not efficient. I think maybe some of the questions I've, I've already asked you a little bit about what you'd cull for, and you answered it with, if they're open, they're gone, right? And I think, man, I wish every cattleman would say that, and we'd probably make a lot more genetic progress in all herds of cattle instead of, oh, man, that cow, uh, she's she's the fattest one. She looks the best. I can't get rid of her, right? Well, there may, maybe there's a reason she's the fattest and looks the best because she hasn't had a calf in a year. But what? Uh, tell me a little bit more, uh, I guess, Evan, as we've got a little bit of time here on if you're going to um, make a genetic selection, uh, maybe are there any, I know you mentioned milk EPD, are there any other traits that you look for? Or is there something that you've noticed with your genetic supplier that they emphasize? And that's really why you selected those genetics. Yes, sir. Um, I guess with that, I, I'm very spread out and I have a lot of stuff on my 
plate in a couple different counties. So time is uh, very valuable to me. So I, I have a couple different things. I have a lot of pasture, many different places. Disposition is probably my second biggest thing. If I see a head go up or somebody wants to go the other side of the pasture while I'm moving, uh, that is an instant. I have a zero tolerance policy on that as well. Uh, the next is calving needs. I can't remember the last time I pulled a calf. Um, I I can't have I can't be out there every day and babysit in those cows. If, like you said earlier, are am I working for the cows or the cows working for me? And I prefer not to not to have to worry about losing a calf anytime, um, let alone if I got to pull it. So those are probably still my top three. Um, but then when I what my goal is, and it kind of has been over the years, but now that I'm to the size of what I want to be at, I'm would do the more the hair coat, um, which one's going to flush up sooner uh, or not as soon, I should say. Those kind of factors are all now coming into role, into play, but with the with the growth that I wanted to get at to the amount of pasture that I had, um, I haven't pushed that as hard as I should have, but uh, I would. I would say still right now, it's still conception, disposition, and uh, uh, the last one was calving. So. I know we're getting close here, but Nicole, there's one other thing that Evan mentioned in our discussion prior to this was epigenetics. I'd like him to elaborate on what he's seen in his herd from an epigenetic standpoint. Uh, something I just wanted to Hopefully it was going to pick your brain on too, but so it's starting, starting this operation and then not having the environment that I would like starting out, you know, everybody wants a nice, beautiful pasture and some great grass. And I've started with probably the bottom of the barrel kind of stuff. So I haven't been, you know, overly enthused with how my cows have performed, but I feel like I'm doing the right steps. It's just getting to the point of where those cattle are, are raised on the best quality stuff, then to know which where that fallout should have actually came from. And if epigenetics was basically what played the role in that or not, is what I mean to ask you. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely an area we're learning more about. I would say you have probably gone um in a pretty I would call it like an advanced rate here. You say, okay, here's, here's an environment that's challenging. I'm going to put these cows in this challenging environment. And if they don't perform, they're gone. And that's, that's going to speed up the amount of, and how fast those cattle adapt. Sometimes that's financially hard to stomach. If you're having to get rid of cows that you just bought and, and you're, you know, so it, there's a balance there. So a lot of times I encourage producers to have some level of transition. So maybe the first year or two, you are supplementing some mineral supplement um, because you know that the soils are depleted or you maybe you are supplementing some level of hay or um, stored forages because you don't have the right amount of stockpile. So increasing the, having that buffer in the first year first couple of years where you're learning where the deficiencies are while you build those deficiencies, I think is useful and can help kind of buffer you financially. Um, the, back to the epigenetics thing. Um, it's real. Um, it's definitely, we've done some research at the University of Illinois with fetal programming. Uh, there's been a lot of research done out West and in the Nebraska group on fetal programming. And I would encourage producers to dive in there if they so choose. But the short story is um, we, we do kind of program these cattle in utero. Uh, that mother cow is giving signals to that in utero baby of what the environment's like. And so in situations where you have restriction, you're going to build in that signal to that calf that, hey, there's not as much here maybe you don't need to be performing to the highest level. So what we've seen a little bit is some depressed reproduction or maybe some depressed pro performance in terms of average daily gain when there's a, a, a lot of limitation. I would say even though your soils are depleted or, or we still here in Illinois have a pretty abundant 
resources in terms of rainfall, in terms of forage production. And so maybe adjusting your stocking rate, you said, hey, I added a farm this year and all of a sudden we've got maybe some more grass and things are working out uh, better. And we're, 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 we're able to stretch that stockpile and our cows are performing more adequately. And so matching those kind of things can help, but it is real. There is signaling that occurs between the cow and the in utero calf that prepare them for what that environment is. The challenging part is we do have variation in our environment from year to year. So good grass years to drought years. So there is going to be in variation within those offspring a little bit. The other thing that I'm really excited I get awful excited about, it's kind of weird, is behavioral things. I think that the calf learns a lot from the mother cow. I think the mother cow, what grass, what plants, what areas um, she spends time in, she teaches that calf a lot in terms of where to graze, what to graze, um, water sources, salt sources, all of that kind of thing. So I think there is... Um, I think there's a lot of that occurs behaviorally from a maternal standpoint, imprinting the the animal right next to them being their offspring. So I think, uh, again, those would go back to kind of, uh, I would say, reinstilling your belief that keeping those calves out of those better performing cows will yield better results in the future in terms of longevity and production in your herd. And that's where I think that there are some challenges buying genetics from far away or different latitudes and longitudes is because there are that that's a lot of transition for an animal. Um, so I, I do think that there are some growing pains that you may need to manage there. Long answer to a really good question. Nicole, I would say jump, jump back in here. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, do we have any uh, final questions for either Travis or Evan from our participants? Uh, see, I don't see any new ones in the chat. So seeing none, uh, Evan and Travis, uh, thank you so much for that discussion. Uh, there was a lot of really good information presented. Um, and thank you to all of our participants for joining us today. Uh, we will share the webinar recording with you uh, via email shortly. And uh, I just want to remind everyone of our next session, uh, which is the fourth uh, part of our six part series. And that will be on Tuesday, February 14th. Uh, so if you're free on Valentine's Day, we will be uh, discussing animal health and parasites. So uh, you can see our website for the upcoming details to that se session and to register. Thank Thanks you, guys. So cool.